Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, learn a little bit more about you know, our approach to fine tuning and aligning LLMs at Snorkel. We're excited to share both research and product with you. Um, just for some context, my name is Marty. I'm on the product team here focused on our development workflows for uh, generative AI for our customers. So imagine an enterprise data scientist looking to fine tune or align their own LLMs, retrieval systems, and the development workflows they would use in our product Snorkel to support that. Uh, I'm Tom Walsh. I'm a senior researcher in our uh, NLP team here at Snorkel AI, and I've been with the company for about six months. Uh, I'm predominantly looking at how we can make uh, fine tuning and alignment more programmatic. How can we approach it like we do software development to do it at scale? Uh, you may have caught our presentation on enterprise alignment last week, which is where we're trying to bring all of these techniques that are apply applied quite generally into the enterprise. Uh, and then prior to that, I was uh, prior to Snorkel, I was in uh, BinServe uh, and Legal Tech, and I think we're ready to go. So today is all about fine tuning, and we're going to start with you know when and why should you fine tune an LLM? It's not applicable in every scenario, but we want to start with outlining the scenarios where it is applicable. We're then going to move on to talk about the how. What techniques can we use to fine tune LLMs, and how can we start thinking about the data required to do so? We're going to then bring it back to Snorkel and talk about the Snorkel AI approach to programmatic data labeling for training and evaluation. And that's going to lead on to a demo by Marty. And at the end, we're going to have some time for questions. So to start with, you know, when and why, where should you use fine tuning and, and when should you start thinking about it? For a lot of tasks, off the shelf models can do pretty well in generalist use cases. However, when you're looking at enterprise use cases, we think, you know, coming from a generalist off the shelf model, you really need to specialize it to get those accuracy gains that take the performance above a threshold that's acceptable. And we see fine tuning as sort of part of the puzzle to help increase this downstream accuracy and to help adapt the models to very specialized tasks or domains where sort of web scale data doesn't really get you the performance you want. Not only are we looking at accuracy on specific tasks, but we're looking to fine tune and improve models with respect to user preferences, those that are internal users or public facing users. And all of this comes under the umbrella of enhanced usability. We want to build systems that are useful, appropriate within enterprise context, and have the relevant contextual information to be safe, compliant, and performant. There was a great piece of work by Predibase recently about the advantages of fine tuning versus just using off the shelf models. You can see some of the results they got here, and I recommend reading Laura Land, their technical report for sort of more in depth analysis. But they were testing LLMs, off-the-shelf models, uh, open source and proprietary across 31 tasks. Their interest was fine-tuning small LLMs as well. What you can see here is going from the base model to the fine-tuned model, we see huge increases in performance such that they match the performance of the off-the-shelf proprietary models. Fine-tuning not only allows you to increase the accuracy of your models, it allows you to use smaller models, which are easier to host and far cheaper. That's part of the motivation about why we want to focus on fine tuning to increase model performance and make it easier to curate the data for it in-house. But when should you fine tune an LLM? Because you probably aren't going to do it in every scenario and you certainly shouldn't start with it. I've got here quite a simplified LLM ops pipeline. Starting from the left, you have your users. The users will put in prompts, maybe instructions, questions, into a system. Retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, is a, is a very vital technique to help bring in external live context into that prompt. So perhaps you're retrieving over documents you want to ask questions over. Perhaps you want to bring in the most relevant current news, stuff that not, may not necessarily be in the knowledge of the LLM. After RAG, you have a prompt but you may want to tweak the system prompts to improve task specific performance. You can add very fine grained instructions or guidelines. So at this point, we have some systems that occur before we've even reached the LLM. And then we put the prompt into the LLM, we generate our response, and maybe that response is great, but 
If it's not, how do we start thinking about where it's failed? So we are thinking about this in sort of two dominant error modes. The first is pre-LLM in terms of retrieval errors. Maybe your RAG system isn't perfect. Maybe it's not retrieving using particularly accurate representations of your domain knowledge, or maybe it's not tuned for a task or generation errors, which occur during the generation process where your LLM has the perfect context, but for some reason, it's not generating responses that are up to your standard. It's failing on your evaluations. We'll see in the demo later on how Marty breaks things down into retrieval and generation errors. But where we see fine tuning for the LLM uh, and its successes is in this reduction of generation errors. So when to fine tune an LLM is when you want to tackle problems in generation. But we think you should start with prompt engineering. It doesn't require any fine tuning or, or uh, modification of model weights. Then you should start with RAG if it's applicable. And then finally, if you're still getting those generation errors, the final piece in the puzzle is to, is to tackle LLM-based fine tuning. So that's when you should think about it and how you might go about it. But these, these are now the techniques you'll, you'll use in production. And after talking about some of the techniques, we'll go on to some of the data considerations. This is a, a great diagram by Meta from their Llama 2 paper. And it goes through the different phases that people generally talk about when they are talking about training an LLM. Looking at the bottom left, we start off with a randomly initialized model. It has no use at this point at all. And we have access to a very large, unsupervised, unstructured uh, collection of text. So this is your web scale data. This could be millions of documents. And through self-supervised learning, we can pre-train the model. This is the next token prediction. So we're not going to cover pre-training today. We're going to focus on what you can do with pre-trained models. Pre-training is very, very expensive. And, uh, and typically, your best sort of cost to performance is achieved by taking an off-the-shelf model, so a generalist model, and adapting it for your downstream task. So when you have your pre-trained model, now we focus on the right-hand side, Fine-tuning the model is typically done in two stages. You may start off with supervised fine-tuning, otherwise called uh, instruction tuning, and then maybe you're going on to more advanced alignment techniques such as reinforcement learning from human feedback or uh, some preference optimization techniques like DPO. So we see training being a three-stage pipeline, starting with pre-training, and then you can decompose the next two steps into fine-tuning and then further alignment. For the supervised stages of that pipeline, we have different data requirements. So I'll just highlight these here. And we'll talk about data further on in the presentation. Supervised fine tuning or instruction tuning is where you have instruction response pairs. For a range of prompts or instructions or questions, you ideally have a gold standard set of how you want the LLM to respond. For example, you could have long documents that you have had an analyst write summaries for. High quality, typically it's been human uh, annotated data, but there are programmatic methods we'll talk about later on. But this is to help guide the LLM and set the format of the responses you want. Preference optimization goes beyond that. For your instructions or prompts, you're looking at pairs of responses. And the idea is you have responses that are preferred. These exhibit the behaviors you want. Perhaps it's stylistic, it's the tone or the formatting. And then you have dispreferred responses. The idea here is you're trying to guide the LLM through optimization of its weights towards the preferred responses and away from the, the dispreferred ones. So those are your two data formats that we'll be focusing on today. With supervised fine tuning, the supervision signal itself comes directly from the instruction response pairs. We put in the prompt to the LLM, and then we look at the first token that it's predicting. And we compare that to the actual token in the gold standard response. Token by token, we do this optimization. And the idea here is we want the model to accurately understand uh, the relationship between the instruction and the response and how to follow these specific instructions. Through generalization as well, we hope that it's able to address tasks or problems beyond its uh, supervised fine tuning data set. RLHF reinforcement learning from human feedback works on a very different paradigm. Separate to training the weights of the LLM, what we need is a reward model. So the supervision signal comes from a model that can determine the quality 
and assign rewards for those responses from an LLM. And what we want to do using algorithms like PPO is adjust the weights of the LLM to increase the expected reward over time. The idea is that the reward model encodes some human values or preference. For example, higher reward could be associated with more harmless outputs. And we want our model through maximizing its rewards to be aligned with those harmless responses. And then building that reward model or quality model requires a lot of human feedback. We take uh, our instruction set, we generate lots and lots of responses. Maybe these can also be human generated. And we ask annotators or we use model feedback to rank them. And we have then a preference data set. From this preference data set, we train a reward model. This is typically a smaller model than the LLM you want to train. But the idea is for an instruction and a given response, it's able to assign a scalar score for them, or it could give binary feedback. Using uh, this offline reinforcement learning pipeline, this is where we actually change the weights of the LLM. We have our instructions. Our LLM generates a response. We understand how good that response is. And then we optimize the model using, say, PPO. And we do this iteratively. So your LLM updates over time. Your reward model is typically frozen. And we, say, converge on a model, on a model that is better with respect to whatever quality metrics we're uh, trying to instill in our reward model. The downside with uh, RLHF is it requires you to have a reward model. So those are quite expensive to build, and there are some problems to do with overfitting to reward models. And that sort of offline reinforcing pipeline is very expensive. You have to iteratively update your LLM, produce new responses, score them, and update. DPO, direct preference optimization, is a technique that came out of Stanford last year. And instead of optimizing first a reward model and then your LLM, they wanted to address the question of why can't you use your preference data to directly optimize the LLM? You know what's good, you know what's bad in terms of responses. There must be some supervision signal there you can use directly. And what they found is they can uh, optimize the model. And there's, it's, it has its own implicit reward signal based on the likelihood of a response being generated. So through direct optimization, what DPO is trying to do is increase the likelihood of good responses, so chosen responses, re responses that meet your criteria, and reduce the likelihood of bad responses, so negative responses, toxic responses, whatever preference you've encoded in your preference data set. And then when compared to RLHF, this method can be more stable, it's certainly more simple, and it avoids the need to train a separate reward model. And then looking at some sort of more recent methods, these are ones we've been looking at in research. First, we have KTO. This is inspired by prospect theory in economics, which focuses on how humans perceive utility. So for your instruction response pairs, so we just need the two, we understand if a response is good or bad using a binary label. And using KTO, we can then use that to optimize the model. And the authors found that this is more robust to label noise than DPO. ORPO is a, a different technique. So that stands for odds ratio preference optimization. You may remember earlier when I was talking about LLAMA2 that a typical pipeline involves, say, supervised fine tuning and then separately some sort of preference optimization. The authors of ORPO found that it was much more computationally efficient to combine these steps together. So you have a single loss function with two components. And they found that not only is this more computationally efficient, but it can outperform techniques such as DPO in some benchmarks. Before I move on to the data side, I wanted to just share sort of one lesson we learned earlier in the year. And you can read about this more on our blog post. Huang in our research team wrote about alpaca eval and you know why we got to the top of the leaderboard, but why we're not there anymore. So in this experiment, we wanted to use reward models to provide signals to generate preference data sets. Chosen rewards should have a high score, rejected rewards should have a low score, and then we can use that for DPO rather than RLHF. However, with reward models, you have the risk of overfitting to them. The reward models are very imperfect. They are an imperfect representation of what a human would assign. And we found that our reward model really liked long responses. Our responses weren't getting better over time if a human were to look at them, but they were getting longer. And when using LLM as a judge, the score would go up, 
but it didn't correlate with what a human annotator would assign to uh, the quality of the responses. So yeah, one lesson we've learned is uh, never fully trust your reward model. So now to move on to the training data portion, how can we do this programmatically? Or how can we start thinking about doing this programmatically? Generalist off-the-shelf models, as I mentioned at the start, are a good baseline, but can underperform when you're using your private data, say data brought in with a RAG system, or they can underperform on specific tasks, or maybe the guard railing that they're instilled with doesn't meet your requirements for either safety or compliance. We want to understand best how we can specialize LLMs to be task and domain specific. And that usually requires transforming unstructured data into this structured form that we saw earlier for LLM training. But in enterprise, it's going to be very typical that your SMEs that can understand the data and that can annotate it correctly are going to be very expensive to use for manual annotation. It's also going to be very slow. Our work here at Snorkel is all about how can we think about programmatic approaches to leverage SMEs to do annotation scalably. And this is in the context of both Gen AI training and providing data for evaluation data sets. To briefly cover the data requirements for each of these fine tuning techniques, for supervised fine tuning, we found that having a diverse set of prompts and instructions is a vital first step. So this is before you consider the responses, focus on your instructions. A diverse instruction set that is representative of your downstream task is a good starting point. For the gold standard responses, the slowest way would be to use an annotator to, to manually write them. A quicker way using weak supervision could be a model writes them and then you have some heuristics to filter them out by quality. You have a quality model there. Or you can use techniques like Benito. Benito was a research paper published last year, which turns unstructured data into supervised tuning data sets. And then another caveat we found is that data should be consistent in tone, style, or format. It's easiest to get consistent outputs when you have consistent inputs. Uh, for RLHF and DPO, uh, again, diverse instructions are very important. But when you're coming up with preferences, we found it's very important to have very clear dimensions that you're trying to assess a preference over. For example, using a specific dimension such as clarity is better than say, you know, pick which one is better across all dimensions. But if your dimension is quite subjective, we can end up with a lot of noise in our data set. So having well-defined preference dimensions, we, we think is the way forward to having better preference data sets and better outcomes for uh, alignment. And the final thing is where you have humans or models creating these rankings, it's very important to avoid encoding human or model bias into them. For example, earlier, if you were to use the reward model that we had to rank responses, you might find the longer responses are always more preferred, independent of their content. So I've got some quite quick lessons learned here, and then we'll move on to uh, Marty. We've found, and we've always believed, that high quality, low noise data is better than large noisy data sets. And then when we're talking about supervised data sets, so either instruction response pairs or instruction preference pairs, it's important to identify those spurious correlations or surface features that bias the data. For example, it may be length bias, it may be biased towards certain companies or individuals. And using your SMEs to evaluate your data and then correct for those biases is an essential part of this iterative data development process. And we think that feeds into robust or, or the need for robust error mode analysis. And part of that is using your SMEs to define fine-grained slices of your data to understand if those biases exist and if your actions are reducing those biases through uh, your evaluation processes. And with that, I would love to hand it over to Marty, who will take you through our approach and then a demo. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. Well, thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to uh, stop by and, and listen to uh, you know some of our, our recent research and then what we're building into our product, Snorkel Flow, um, focused on this this idea of fine tuning and aligning large language models. So I'll start with a, a general overview of LLM systems or generative AI systems as our our clients are are largely building them and how we see them. 
We'll talk about the um, development approach that we are encoding into our product Snorkel Flow, and then we'll actually show parts of this live to you. So I'll start with a very simplified view of how our customers are building generative AI systems, whether they be co-pilots, chatbots, document Q&A systems. Uh, there's a large amount of uh, you know, private unstructured data that is getting chunked and put into some sort of vector database um, with, with some sort of embedding representation. And then when users are asking questions uh, or or asking the system to complete an instruction, the retrieve context is sort of pulled into the prompt along with the instruction and a large language model generates the response. Now, before we even get into thinking about evaluation and development, we found that anchoring on um, you know, two different components in this system um, makes development a lot more sort of intuitive and, and easy to kind of understand where you need to go. So uh, we, we bucket our, our evaluation into retrieval and generation. So or an example of a retrieval you know, error would be that if I'm asking an instruction and I notice that the retrieve context at, doesn't actually contain the information that, the, that I would need to properly answer the question, that's a retrieval error. Whereas a generation error is, uh, hey, I'm looking at the retrieve context. It looks like it's correct. However, the generated response from the large language model is not adhering to my organization's preferences, objectives, or policies. And so the focus of today's demo will be on um, identifying and solving generation errors for your generative AI projects. If you go to our blog, you'll also find a couple of weeks back, we did a similar webinar focused on development workflows to address retrieval-based errors. So um, both of these are, are getting built into our product Snorkel Flow, but again, today we'll focus on generation. When we dig into approaches to solve generation errors, Tom talked about uh, many of these techniques as well as some that aren't even listed here. But the thing that I want to highlight is that whether we're conducting supervised fine tuning or alignment via RLHF or DPO, human feedback today is what drives these uh, techniques and drives this progress in capabilities, this progress in, in safety that you're seeing from some of these, um, these labs. And what we found is when we try and take this and apply it to, when our customers try and take these techniques and apply them on their own, this manual approach does not scale. So as Tom mentioned, our mission at Snorkel is to make these manual data development approaches look a lot more like software development. So you'll hear me use the word programmatic a lot. We're trying to take those things that we're doing manually in this process and, and make them programmatic. So how do we align a large language model programmatically in Snorkel? Well, we'll start by evaluating an existing generative AI system. We'll assess it for production quality. If it falls below our production quality benchmarks, We'll analyze the solution for gaps in performance. We'll actually spend most of our time focusing on the data um, that's being passed to this model in service of training, fine tuning, prompting, or retrieval. We'll then conduct actual fine tuning, which you'll see in the product VR integrations. And we'll, we'll onboard the newly fine tuned large language model into Snorkel, regenerate responses, and evaluate this. As Tom mentioned, we, we strongly believe that this development process needs to be iterative. Um, and so you'll hopefully get some intuition behind the iterative loop that we're building inside of our product here, because we keep going through this loop until we've met our production quality benchmarks. And then we're, we're, we're confident that we can deploy this co-pilot, this chatbot uh, for our customers uh, with a high level of, of confidence and accuracy. So for our demo today, we are working at Acme Credit Services, and we're building a co-pilot for our customer service agents called Jarvis. And Jarvis is designed to sit right alongside our customer service agents. And for a given question from a user about their credit score or filing disputes or their credit report, be able to generate a factual, grounded, helpful response to the user. And uh, Acme Credit Services, we estimate that this will um, double the efficiency of our CSAs and save us over $25 million a year. This is very similar to a customer use case that we uh, recently completed over the last couple of months. So excited to dig into this use case a little bit more. We'll start by going into our pre-production environment where we're noticing some odd behavior from the current version of Jarvis. 
So maybe I'll start as a domain expert, maybe asked to do some testing here. Maybe I'll ask, um, how is my credit score calculated? And we're just, we, we just stood up a simple streamlet app. Uh, this is not snorkel flow just to give some intuition behind maybe the, uh, performance of this co-pilot in production or pre-production environment. So as a domain expert, I'm looking at this response and it, it's pretty good. It's giving, it's maybe a little bit more verbose than I would want, but it's giving me, um, you know, correct percentages here for calculation of FICO scores. But maybe if I ask something a little bit more specific, let's say um, I have some weird clothing charges on my credit report, how can I dispute? Uh, and as we're looking at this response, we start to see some problems. Um, so first off, uh, we see what looks to be a hallucination, uh, the large language model talking about stock purchases, when in reality, I asked about clothing charges. Um, there's a recommendation here to contact the SEC and file a police report, which uh, as a domain expert, uh, you know, putting my hat on, I know that this isn't something that you should actually be doing. And there's a very prescribed set of steps uh, that you would do inside of Acme's website to actually solve this problem. So we know we have a problem, but we need to get a little bit more of a comprehensive review of our instructions and the various responses from the Jarvis Copilot to understand how much of a problem we actually have. So we'll start by manually annotating um, examples of instructions, responses, and retrieve context in Snorkel Flow. So now we're in our flagship product. Uh, snorkel flow, and we are logged in as a domain expert, and we're looking at a, a various uh, prompt, the prompt prefix, or the often called the system prompt, a large language model's response, and then the retrieved context objects that are coming from our RAG pipeline. So you can think of snorkel as the place where you're going to develop artifacts that will improve your production solution, not the place necessarily where you're hosting that production solution. Um, so as a domain expert, I can uh, look uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see all the different label schemas that I can label in this particular use case. So I can I have a single label schema for each piece of retrieve context. And for the sake of this example, I've just created a simple thumbs up, thumbs down for each piece of retrieve context in the overall large language model response. However, you could imagine um, creating uh, any sort of label schema that you would want you know, multi-dimensional, one to five, uh, free text label schema to be able to actually provide the right uh, degree of structured and unstructured feedback as your use case demands. So maybe I come in and I label the large language model response, and then I look at the various retrieve contexts and I label them. And I go through this process for a representative subset of documents. Maybe it's 50 to 75 documents just to get a sense of how well our system is performing. Meanwhile, uh, while I'm going through these documents as a domain expert, I can tag um, you know, sections of the document that may be interesting. So for example, if there's like a table of contents, oftentimes what we find is like with retrieval systems, perhaps like a table of contents is often retrieved. That's not very helpful, right? That can go in service of tuning our RAG system. Um, but I, I can also do things like adding comments. So I can say, this isn't, a realistic question, something like that. We feel very strongly at Snorkel that to build successful, whether it's generative or predictive or any type of, of ML or AI initiative in the enterprise, there needs to be a single platform where the domain experts and the data scientists or machine learning engineers can collaborate um, because the, the input from those domain experts is critical to actually tuning and training these, these systems. All right, so maybe I've done a little bit of baselining with uh, some manual labels. Where do I go next? As we mentioned at Snorkel, we one of the unique things with, with generative use cases is that the manual labels collected by domain experts, whether they're quality labels, one to five rankings, um, they are uh, effectively thrown out with each iteration of fine tuning. Um, so they're they're sparse, and as you're fine tuning an LLM, you effectively lose the quality labels that you had collected before because there are new responses that are generated. So why don't we encode the definition of good versus bad into an actual model inside of Snorkel? 
Uh, and so what we'll do next is we're actually going to build what we call a quality model inside of Snorkel. And very simply, a quality model can be thought of as something that can look at an instruction context response triple and basically give a ranking uh, or a, a you know an accept reject in the simplest form and some degree of confidence in that prediction. Now, how do we actually build this quality model? Well, we take the same logical thought processes that a domain expert is going through when they're evaluating a single response for good and bad, and we, we encode those into what we call labeling functions. Labeling functions can be thought of as heuristics that are used, whether keyword-based, regular expression, dictionaries, prompts to large language models, embeddings, any source of positive signal that can be used to label unlabeled data in service of training a model. So we'll build this quality model. We'll build it far faster than we would manually because we're able to write these labeling functions. And then we'll use this quality model in a couple, couple different ways. So first off, you could imagine taking the subset of predictions from the quality model where it's most confident in a, uh, a good instruction context response triple and using that as a data set for SFT or instruction fine tuning. Moreover, you could imagine pairing up good and bad responses for uh, a variant of DPO, as Tom had discussed, or any of the other sort of KTO or ORPO strategies um, would also benefit from being able to use this, um, this model's predictions. Not only do you use the, the model in service of finding a good data set for fine tuning, you can also use it for evaluation. Because as I mentioned before, after you've fine tuned, you're going to now regenerate responses over your instruction set. And so you need to go, you know, in a manual world, you need to go to your domain experts and go collect new labels. But what the quality model affords you is a proxy for directional improvement in your, in your development workflow um, automatically. Because we can now just run that quality model over your new instruction context response pair triples and give you a directional signal as to whether you're moving up or down. So let's actually go into Snorkel and build this quality model. So now we're putting on our data scientist hat and we're inside of Snorkel and we're building a quality model. And as I mentioned, the primary building block for this quality model is labeling functions. So a couple of examples that I'll highlight in service of training this quality model would be, uh, let's start by, why don't we prompt a large language model um, to help us directionally label uh, a large portion of our data? So for example, I know that the Jarvis Copilot should be responding in numbered or bolded lists. That's a really good source of positive signal. So we should include that as a, as a labeling function. However, on the flip side, um, maybe, uh, let me hop over here. Maybe if my um, maybe if my responses from my large language model contain the word last update um, or something that I know is very common from like a you know a parroting large language model that's coming from training on GPT-4 outputs, that's actually not a phrase that I want to include. Uh, so that would be a sign that you know this this uh, this isn't a good response, right? So you can imagine collecting these signals that are coming from your domain experts and actually writing those as labeling functions. You write seven, eight, nine labeling functions and inside of Snorkel, you can actually train one of these quality models. And so for the sake of simplicity, I chained on a very simple architecture here using logistic regression, um, but you could imagine increasing the complexity vector. We're actively improving the architectures made available for quality model training inside of our platform. But now we have a model that can kind of steer the outputs of our large language model. And this is a technique that the leading sort of model providers are using. We know this from sort of the research that they're putting out, but what we wanna make available to our customers is the actual development workflow that allows them to train and, and adapt these quality models on their own in service of these same initiatives. So now that we have a quality model, we can look at an evaluation of our all of our data um, and the acceptance rate, so basically the percentage of time that our responses are actually getting accepted as measured by ground truth and as measured by our quality model. And you can see that the predictions or the percentages or proportions are a little bit different here, but they're generally in the same uh, sort of ballpark. So we, we, we feel relatively confident that our quality model is doing a good job at predicting good and bad uh, sort of responses.
So where do we go next? Well, the next step here is actually to curate a data set that can be used to fine tune a large language model. So to do this, we'll jump into a notebook. This is a Jupyter notebook that's attached to our snorkel flow instance. So everything I'm showing you in the UI is also uh, able to be achieved in the SDK. And some of the more advanced operations are actually only accessible there right now. But why don't we just take our quality model and use it to say, hey, if this model is highly confident in a good instruction context response, let's actually create a curated data set of these examples from our larger set of instruction context response pairs. What we can then do is we can actually go and take that data set and send it to a large language model for fine tuning. So in this example, I'm using our SDK and our integration with SageMaker Jumpstart to actually use this curated data to go out and fine tune the uh, Llama 3 8B instruct base model that was used as the V1 of this copilot that you saw in my earlier environment. And so if we were to go over and hop into our SageMaker instance, you'd see this actual job getting kicked off and the fine tuning occurring over there. So we kick off the fine tuning from Snorkel and after the fine tuning is complete, Snorkel will automatically stand up the fine tuned model and generate new responses for our instructions. And so in this single loop, and it, it kind of depends on how long it'll take based off of you know, what model you're using to fine tune, what instances you're fine tuning, you'll be able to curate that data set, kick off a fine tuning job, go grab a cup of coffee, come back and have your new data automatically onboarded to Snorkel. So again, I'll just show you real quick. If I refresh this, we should see a training job in our Amazon SageMaker instance, a fine tuning job that got kicked off here. Oh, awesome. Looks like we got two. So back to the demo. Now that we have a fine tuned model, we can actually look at the performance of our first attempt, our base model, our V1, and the performance of our fine tuned model in a single evaluation pane inside of Snorkel. So now what you're looking at is across all your data, what is my ground truth acceptance rate, AKA the proportion of, of times as measured by a domain expert that I'm getting good responses. And what is the acceptance rate as measured by my quality model? And you'll notice that right now, we don't have any ground truth actually inside for our second iteration because we just fine tuned this model. But what we do get for free are these quality model metrics. So what I'm showing you here are like a couple metrics that come out of the box with Snorkel, but you could also go and register and create your own custom metrics here for that are important for your use case. But you can see that even this simple approach of creating a quality model, using that quality model's predictions to find the good data, like Tom was mentioning, that high quality data results in a 7.8% bump in overall acceptance rate. So let's press pause here for a second and just take stock of what we've done so far. So we noticed in our pre-production environment that we had some sort of failure modes, but we didn't exactly know how to fix them. So we onboarded data to Snorkel. We labeled that data to get a sense of how well we're performing as measured by our domain experts. We identified uh, some generation errors and we built a quality model to help us scale this measurement of good versus bad. We use the quality models predictions to create a high quality data set. We take that high quality data set and we fine tune our LLM. We bring those predictions back into Snorkel and we can see an overall lift. So this is a great, this is a great starting point. But what I want to propose is that to actually build robust generative AI in the enterprise, we need to take it one step further. We need to not only ensure that our solution is globally highly accurate, but it's also highly accurate across important data slices. So Tom mentioned this earlier, but data slices are another programmatic operator that we are building inside of our product to round out a comprehensive way to evaluate LLM outputs. So while one axis of your evaluation is something like quality, you can imagine data slices help you identify the distribution of your data. So ensuring that you're, you're generating high quality outputs for each distribution of your data or the things that your solution is supposed to be good at answering. So in this example, maybe I write a slicing function, which is just a way in which you can identify a data slice for my disputes when people are asking about disputes as we saw in the, in the pre-prod environment. And we can see that even though my overall response accuracy is 75%, 
I'm actually performing really poorly when people are asking about disputes. And this not only helps me ensure that I'm building a solution that's good across all the categories I care about, but as a developer, I now can double click into my data slice on topics that are focused on disputes and do the following things. I can address bad dispute related responses. I could go fire this data off to a domain expert to say, hey, go write the gold standard response for how you're supposed to respond when people are asking about this type of dispute. Maybe I can actually upsample more good dispute examples in my curated data set. So that previous example I just showed you was just filtering based off the quality model, but you could imagine also using these data slices and services of creating a really high quality data mixture. We have some really interesting research from our affiliates uh, in this area as well, in a paper called Do Re Mi. And then lastly, maybe this is just an underrepresented slice and I need to go back to an LLM and generate new data for this data slice uh, so that I can generate more high quality responses either from an LLM or from a human. So how do we actually make data slices manifest in our, uh, in our product? When we think about writing data slices, you can again, think of them as labeling functions, but instead of it, a labeling function to determine good versus bad, this is sort of the distribution of our data. So I'll just call out a couple in service of uh, time here, uh, but you can imagine all the tools that I mentioned that are at your disposal for writing labeling functions are at your disposal for writing slicing functions. So prompts, embeddings, uh, heuristics like dictionaries or keywords, regular expressions. I could say like, hey, if this fast text model uh, predicts that this the, the language is Spanish, then we should put that data point in the is Spanish slice. Or um, maybe if I see the word password, email, or username in the res in the instruction, um, then that's probably a user asking about an admin feature. Let's go register that data slice. And so now what we get when we combine this measurement of quality via the quality model and these data slices, we get a view into our data that looks something like this. So now we can both see that for a given iteration, we can see how well I'm doing across all of my data, but I can also see slice by slice, how well am I performing? For fear of making things a little too busy, I do wanna also show that we can not only show this slice wise comparison across for a given model iteration, but we can also show it between two different model iterations. So on your left-hand side, you're seeing our first version in our pre-prod environment that was having some issues with disputes. And on the right-hand side, you can see our fine-tuned model and if we look at the dispute slice, it looks like we actually see a 4.3% bump as measured by the quality model uh, in, this, in this particular data slice. So we feel that at Snorkel, this, this is the view that you need as a developer to actually understand how well your model is performing across this various distribution of topics that it's supposed to be good at, at these various scenarios, and the ability to then double click into that data slice and go directly address the problems that you're seeing from the model. So we do this development, we build this quality model, we write these slicing functions, and then we redeploy a fine tuned LLM. And when we take that same question, let me go grab it. And we run it against our fine tuned LLM we can see that we're getting much better responses. So we're seeing a more detailed response. It's much more helpful. It's containing some of the information that we saw previously. Um, however, we're also seeing that it's it's definitely more specific to Acme Co. I know there's a lot of new techniques and topics that were covered there. I'm sure many questions in the chat, but hopefully this gives you some intuition behind the programmatic approaches that we're bringing to fine tuning and aligning LLMs in Snorkel. Um, we are making this workflow uh, available in private beta very shortly uh, for our customers. So if you're interested in, in trying out this workflow, providing feedback to our team, we're very interested to hear from you, hear about your use cases, and uh, see if it's a good fit. So with that, um, it looks like um, we'll start off with Marty, maybe. How much impact does the gold standard response impact the training? Sometimes using big LLMs generated output kind of contain noise. Uh, what would you recommend? We've designed our platform, our product to be interoperable between the two major approaches that we're seeing when it comes to domain experts providing feedback. So what I showed you was a domain expert looking at an existing response and sort of giving a thumbs up, thumbs down, or one to five ranking. 
um, we find that that feedback mechanism is a little bit lower effort on the domain expert, right? Because they just have to label something in the same way they would for a predictive model. Now, the gold standard response is also a supported label schema inside of our product. So as a domain expert, you could, if asked, provide free text, uh, what the what the gold standard answer should be. Either way, when you're as you're converging on sort of an ideal response, we have found that creating that small, high quality set and fine tuning a base model can um, actually outperform some of the existing sort of uh, closed source model providers. One of our customers saw a 16 point boost in overall response accuracy um, when they fine tuned Mistral instead of using uh, an open AI. So uh, gold standard responses go a long way. Uh, and someone asks, when should we fine tune versus giving the LLM examples in the prompt? Exploring in context learning is a great first step. So that's something you can do without modifying any model weights, without performing any fine tuning. So prompt engineering in context learning, great to try first and then test the performance on your downstream task. If that still doesn't work, fine tuning is a great next step. Can Snorkel assist with data preparation and pre-processing such as embedding, transforming, cleaning, et cetera? Yes, we can. Yeah, the, uh, the application that I was showing you today is structured as a graph. And so you could imagine as various pieces of that graph, there are both out of the box and custom pre-processing operations that you can um, execute inside of Snorkel. And most of those are basic Python code that uh, is fully documented and supported in our SDK. So all the pre-processing stuff that was alluded to in the research talk, like Bonito, as well as any sort of custom pre-processing that you would want to do is supported in our product. Great. And if folks want to see the product, uh, you can always go to snorkel.ai slash demo, and the team would be happy to learn more about your use case, your data types, uh, and see if there's a great fit. Or if you're interested in uh, the upcoming uh, product release that Marty showed, we can certainly connect with you there. So um, this one potentially for Tom, someone has two questions. Should you fine tune models to get structured responses, say in case of prompt chaining? If not, what are some ways to get structured responses, uh, especially from open source models? That's the first yep. question. Depending on how complex your structure is, um, a lot of open source models, so Mistral has implemented this now, have a JSON response mode. So they have performed instruction tuning, so you should get better JSON outputs. Uh, certain models have preferences for other types of structured outputs, say XML and Markdown. So uh, through prompt engineering, you may be able to achieve the structured response you want. If it's failing, or if it's quite a nuanced or proprietary format, fine tuning would be a great uh, use case there. Great. And the second question is, how can you increase the context length of these models? Depending on what you want to put in, perhaps you want to perform RAG. You want to chunk your documents and just feed in uh, chunks of a document or a series of documents that are high relevancy. Um, if you have already explored RAG, there's many open source models available and proprietary models that have already sort of explored increasing context, le context lengths for you. So uh, I'd explore the models on Hugging Face. I think this one's for you, Marty. Uh, how does Snorkel fit into the AI ecosystem? What other providers or solutions do you integrate with? This is probably a bit of an oversimplification, but I like to think of Snorkel as sort of the VS code for your data scientists as they're developing AI applications. So we are the place where you go to develop models, tune models, um, but we're not necessarily the place where you host those models in production. However, we do integrate with pretty much every single model provider where, where you'd be hosting these things. So uh, all three hyperscalers are supported, AWS, Azure, um, and, uh, and GCP, as well as Databricks and Snowflake for data ingress. So bringing data in from those sources, using Snorkel to both label and train models, and then take those trained models and, and deploy them inside of the, the same providers that I mentioned. I think this one will be for Tom. Our use case is to get the LLM to communicate using only simple language for the benefit of second language speakers. Is there any value to tuning with examples of simple language labeled preferred and complex language as non-preferred? Or is this something that's best left to regular prompt engineering? So if you're finding that prompt engineering uh, is unable to provide the uh, simplified language you want, this is a great use case for preference optimization. So as you say, your preferred responses are the, the simpler ones, your rejected ones are the more complex ones, and you're aiming to steer the model behavior towards providing simpler outputs for your given inputs. So this is a great use case for fine tuning. Uh, and for Tom, uh, if you want to align various dimensions, do you generate one data set for each? 
depending on how complex your different preferences are and you know whether they correlate you may want to have one preference data set where you uh rank all your preferences at one or if your preferences are quite different you may construct one preference data set for each and you can have one quality model or you could have multiple quality models depending on uh, your use case so i think it's is quite dependent on the task at hand hey john i saw a couple questions in there around like how do you know what are good labeling functions to write um and i think i forgot to cover this in the demo but one of the things that's worth mentioning is the core IP that started Snorkel as a company that came out of the Stanford AI Research Lab is the technology that takes these labeling functions, denoises them, um, and finds the correct programmatic label to assign in the places where these labeling functions conflict or overlap. So what that means in practice is that when you're writing these labeling functions in Snorkel, you actually don't need to make them 100% accurate. So that example I gave about a, a bulleted list into a prompt LF, that's that's going to be noisy, right? There's going to be plenty of examples where there's a, a bulleted list, um, but it's actually wrong. But the nice thing is I can just encode these positive sources of signal, and the snorkel system is designed to adjudicate between these signal and arrive at what it thinks the most likely programmatic label is, and then go train that model, you know, that uh, that jet that uh, discriminative model to to sort of generalize beyond the the labels that I initially provided via the labeling functions. Awesome. I think that's a great question uh, to end on. So we'd love to see you at an upcoming demo or webinar and uh, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. That's how we send out all of our event announcements. And with that, thank you so much, uh, Tom, Marty, for joining us today. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to join the webinar. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar or event. Thanks everybody. Thank you.